Hello, my name's Chris, what's yours? Welcome back to my channel where as well as doing a Doctor Who marathon from the very beginning and a James Bond 007 super marathon of all the novels and films in release order, I'm also talking about new Doctor Who as it happened. To uh, check out my thoughts on each individual episode, my immediate thoughts as close to the airing as possible, then go and check out my digesting all new episodes of Doctor Who playlist. And I'm not gonna repeat myself too much, but I thought it would be prudent to now that the dust has settled, uh, so to speak, uh, on season one, I thought I'd just sort of like talk about my thoughts of this new era so far. Now, regular viewers to the channel will know that I was, I suppose, a skeptic when it came to Russell T Davies coming back. I was not uh, the biggest fan uh, of the first RTD era, uh, partly because of uh, not really being a huge fan of the Tenth Doctor either. Um, so when it was announced that the new era was going to start with Russell C. Davies bringing back David Tennant as the Doctor and Catherine Tate as Donna, uh, my heart sank a little bit. As I speak to you right now, following the conclusion of Season 1 slash Series 14 slash Season 40, my heart is still a little bit sunk but not for the reasons that I thought. The 60th anniversary specials were not a successful celebration of 60 years of Doctor Who. I think that's safe to say that I still think that I will stand by that. What they were, were three episodes of Doctor Who that as a whole were better than I expected. The era, even though it did have the recurring elements of David Tennant, Catherine Tate, and uh, Russell D. Davis, and Murray Gold, uh, and Phil Collins and Julie Gardner and Jane Tranter uh, it didn't feel like a repeat it did feel like a continuation and it actually felt like a new era and I was pleasantly surprised by that not least because I could tell that there were differences in how David Tennant played the Doctor and as a result I think the 14th Doctor is better than the 10th Doctor so straight away uh, the Star Beast was fairly sort of like uh, a straightforward uh, season opener from the old days, uh, but it had enough in there to uh, to keep me intrigued. I always like the beginning of a new uh, Doctor, a new era. It always feels uh, exciting, and I think the Star Beast did have that because it didn't feel just like the Tenth Doctor had come back. I know uh, people's mileage varies, and they do think it exactly felt like the Tenth Doctor had come back, but I did detect. Uh, that David Tennant was ringing the changes and the 14th Doctor to me feels very different from the 10th. Wild Blue Yonder came along and uh, was not what I expected at all, but it pleasantly surprised me. Uh, the Giggle, I um, I know that that's a lot of people's favorite of the three specials. For me, it's way down there. It, 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 didn't, uh, it didn't cap them off in a very satisfying way. It didn't negotiate the change from 14 to 15 in a way that I liked at all. Uh, the, the Toy Maker was uh, a fun performance by Neil Patrick Harris, but not as formidable a villain as he was made out. And that's going to be a recurring theme as I go through the episodes. So I went into the church on Ruby Road, excited for Shuti Gatwa, uh, because his uh, last little bit in the giggle, I do think he came in and just sort of like walked away with the show, uh, which he was meant to do, he's the new Doctor. Uh, Church on Ruby Road, he was very good, Millie Gibson was fantastic, uh, it was messy that episode uh, and I came away from that one uh, fairly disappointed. So by this point it was a 50% hit rate, the Star Beast and the Wild Blue Yonder I'd liked and the Giggle and the Church on Ruby Road I thought were lacking. So it was with caution that I went into the new season and Space Babies, like the Star Beast, did a fairly good job of kicking the season off in a fairly inoffensive uh, knockabout kind of way. So I had far fewer problems with the Space Babies than a lot of people uh, seemed to. The Devil's Chord, on the other hand, see the giggle. Uh, Maestro was an excellent performance as a villain, not that formidable while set out to be. Despite that really excellent scene where the Doctor removes the sound in order to keep themselves hidden, by far and away the highlight of the episode. Other than that, uh, we fell into the trap of this villain is undefeatably godlike. Oh, except there you go. Uh, Boom. Uh, actually, when Boom came along, my initial immediate reaction when I did the video 
was that it was the best episode in a really long time and so therefore i ended up sort of including that as uh, the best episode of this new era so far uh, that may have changed now the dust has settled because i've gone back and i will end this video on a ranking of all the episodes so far and when i did that it doesn't necessarily correlate with those immediate videos that I did um, and it's partly the reason I did those videos as well which was sort of like a, uh, I was mulling over and chewing over my thoughts about them and obviously uh, with the distance between them now uh, things might change and they have. Boom was uh, solid, it was strong, it uh, gave Shutigawa uh, a fantastic platform to show exactly what he can do as the Doctor uh, in a kind of like stripped back way um, which uh, I thought he did admirably in. And throughout the four episodes, uh, The Church on Ruby Road, Space Babies, Devil's Cord and Boom, uh, Millie Gibson and Shutigatwa uh, bonded in such a way that they became very quickly an impressive TARDIS team uh, for me. Uh, Space Babies and uh, Devil's Cord and Church on Ruby Road did consolidate that feeling that Russell T Davies wasn't just repeating himself uh, it did feel like a new era, uh, which was helped by the fact that it was a brand new Doctor and a brand new companion that we'd never seen before. Um, I didn't feel like we were just getting Russell T Davies playing the hits at this point. Moffat obviously wrote Boom, and he seems like uh, a writer uh, re-energised, uh, whether that's the seven years off, or whether or not it's just that it's a new Doctor and he's really responding well to it, or the fact that he's uh, inspired by what was essentially a strong idea, which was to take that scene from Genesis of the Daleks where he stands on a landmine and apply that to the whole episode. Boom felt like uh, we were cooking now. And then 73 Yards comes along, which uh, turns out is divisive. I uh, am one of the ones that really, really liked it. I thought Millie Gibson carrying that episode was fantastic. And again, it wasn't what I expected. I expected it to take fully in that, take place completely in that pub in Wales, and I would, I would have loved that. Um, those characters were excellent. The way it was written was really fun. But then Ruby goes home, and then it jumps forward a few years. And at no point did I feel like I wanted to go back. I went with it each time. Uh, obviously, it does not give you any answers. And I do remember saying at the time that uh, I'm okay with it not giving me any answers. If those answers come, the quality of those answers will affect the episode though they come in rather than 73 yards which is like an, uh, an exercise in uh, atmosphere and I th still think that I still think 73 yards was uh, very very strong. Dot and Bubble was probably the episode that showed me more than any so far that this is not Russell T Davis repeating himself. This is an episode that I just wasn't expecting at all. Now, full disclosure, Dot and Bubble, uh, I think I've already said this, I enjoyed how it made me think more than I enjoyed the episode itself. The ending of it, which recontextualized a lot of things, obviously, was uh, devastatingly performed by uh, Shuti Gatwa and Kali Cook and Millie Gibson needs to take some credit for that as well. She has that wonderful little background work that she does that's like superb. The rest of the episode uh, is uh, it's, it's 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 still got problems for me, but uh, but that ending recontextualizing everything it engaged my brain in a way that I'm not going to write it off completely, but I still can't say that I enjoyed the episode all that much. Uh, Rogue uh, comes along, and what a debut for uh, uh, Bryony Redman and Kate Heron. I thought they understood the brief to perfection. Uh, fun, breezy episode, daft, bonkers, bird alien villains, uh, Indira Varma as the Duchess, oh, chewing the scenery, like so much fun. And then it has that utter curveball that is got fans all in a tizzy, myself included, by including the Schalke Doctor in the uh, Parade of Doctor's Faces, which is gonna keep us uh, discussing and speculating for, years to come because I honestly think that's the only reason it's there. I don't, I don't think we're going to see the Schalke Doctor again. I don't think 
that it's going to be explained as to why he's there. I think it was just being like, yeah, there's something for the fans to discuss. Loved it. Which then brought us to the finale, which uh, more than any other episodes felt like Russell T. Davis repeating himself. This was a Russell T. Davis finale, if ever I saw one. Um, and it was probably the weakest of them. When I said my heart sank when I heard that Russell T. Davis was coming back and bringing David Tennant and uh, Catherine Tate along with him and my heart remains sunk now, it's not because it was the whole time. I was won over. Uh, I was even made to feel a little bit silly for, uh, for, for, for being so skeptical. Uh, and then the finale comes along and I genuinely thought it was rubbish and being so emphatic about that is uh, a disappointment in and of itself I shouldn't shouldn't have to be that emphatic about not liking Doctor Who but there we are it was a mess messy it wasn't satisfying for me in any way whatsoever it didn't pay off any of the threads in a way that I would consider satisfying it didn't uh uh, do Sutek much, much justice uh, the redeeming feature of the finale uh, in my opinion was uh, Bonnie Langford as Mel uh, her brief appearance in the giggle and then uh, her more substantial reappearance in uh, uh, The Legend of Ruby Sunday and Empire of Death showed that she wasn't just brought back for the sake of it like that she's an excellent character and has been given something of a rehabilitation considering how perception of mel in the 80s wasn't all that favorable uh, so bonnie langford uh is the jewel in the crown of that finale not too concerned about ruby turning out to have uh an ordinary uh, birth mother but i am concerned that that's the solution to the mystery that was set up like i wouldn't have minded but it was all, it wasn't misdirection either. It was falsehoods and false breadcrumbs and it didn't make any sense for me at all. Like I didn't buy the pointing at the road sign and I didn't buy the fact that the mystery was powerful enough to make it snow wherever they went. That's not, that's not the mystery that's solved by we made it important. And I know there's more to come in season two and while I didn't mind 73 yards not giving me any answers, uh, the finale to a season when we've got to wait such a long time, I think, I think we need answers in the finale. And the finale did ostensibly give us some answers, but they weren't, they weren't very good ones. So I sit here at the moment with uh, having enjoyed the season and the new era largely more than I thought I would but until there's a new episode of Doctor Who to take the taste away uh, from the finale I'm left underwhelmed uh, obviously that doesn't mean that I'm unfair to the episodes uh, that aren't that finale this is solely the fault of the finale and those episodes will take the blame uh, the era itself is uh, one so far, I've enjoyed more than I thought I would. Uh, I'm clinging on to that. And Shooter Gatwa and Millie Gibson are, for my money, a really good doctor and a really good companion and fantastic together. So it's nice that Ruby will be back and they can continue exploring that dynamic with the added uh, ingredient of a new companion in there as well. That's how I feel about the new era at the moment. Uh, going off the uh, videos I did after each episode, then... Um, uh, boom looked like it would be at the very top um, but let's uh, let's see because now the just to settle the t like you know more t time has passed uh, I've had more time for these episodes to percolate in my brain so I'm now going to rank uh, the episodes worst to best from uh, um, the 60th anniversary specials uh, Christmas special and season one so let, let's uh, let, let's let's see what they are Number 12, Empire of Death. I did wonder whether or not to just, because normally, obviously, a story is a story, and this was a two-part uh, finale uh, of lumping these two together, but they're, uh, I, mean, you, I mean, it's much of a muchness. Uh, the, spoiler alert, this is number 12, Legend of Ruby Sunday is number 11, so uh, uh, I thought I'd 
talk uh, until they come to being on the marathon, uh, I thought I'd treat them as uh, separate episodes. So, Empire of Death is, uh, I only did the video last week, not much has changed since then, uh, mentioned it in this video even, did not satisfactorily round off the season in a good way at all, but um, apart from that, there, there was too many other things in there that just didn't work for me. It was a lovely scene between uh, uh, Sean Clifford and Shuti Gatwa, but it felt like a different story completely. And I understand that the Doctor needs to walk in the devastation for you to feel that the universe has been destroyed, but that wasn't it. They had to land everywhere with Su Tech for the dust to take hold, but they can reverse it just by dragging him through the time vortex. It doesn't really, it didn't really hold together and was a very disappointing end to the season. Number 11, Legend of Ruby Sunday. Part one of the finale, uh, I'd say it was marginally better. What I'm seeing is a lot of uh, reaction was that while Empire of Death was, I'm not gonna say universal, but it was overwhelmingly disappointing for a, a, a lot of people. Some people still did actually quite like The Legend of Ruby Sunday, but even from that early doors, I, I thought it was a messy, messy story. Uh, I did hope that Empire of Death would come around and uh, bring it up, bring the average up, but it, 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 it didn't, if anything, it brought it down. But as a part one, I don't think The Legend of Ruby Sunday worked particularly well. So that just contributes. That's two disappointing episodes in a row. Uh, and now we have to wait till Christmas. Number 10, The Devil's Court. Yeah. Uh, Jinx Monsoon as Maestro, I thought was very good. I did not think Maestro was very good. Um, uh, Maestro, Maestro suffered in the same way that the Toymaker did and in the same way that Sutek did. Set up to be overwhelming odds, but easily defeatable. I didn't believe the casting of the Beatles. I didn't understand the effect that had been had. So like if Maestro was taking music from people, like why, why, why were they still making an album and recording? And it just, the, the, the musical number, I hated it. Uh, partly that's down to me not liking musicals. Um, but even, even then, it, you know, I can be swept along in fun, but it, it, it felt bolted on. And I know it was in an episode about music so it should have felt I guess more natural than it did but it, it just didn't and in fact I found it I found myself sort of like embarrassed I found myself cringing at the, at the musical number and that, as again that's the way it en ends the episode it's what you sort of like walk away with um, uh, but e even then uh, I didn't find uh, I found Jinx Monsoon impressive I didn't find Maestro impressive uh, and the whole the whole idea behind it didn't uh, didn't resonate with me at all. Um, so, yeah, that's why that's why it's as low down as it is. Number nine, the church on Ruby Road. This one is messy, messy. It rather than it feeling like a third act, when the goblins go back and take Ruby uh, as a baby. That feels like a new story beginning. And if we're sort of like introducing a new companion in the same way that Russell D. Davies introduced Rose, a good way to do that, and Martha, a good way to do that is to meet the Doctor through their eyes, which we do not do uh, in the Church on Ruby Road because we see him watching her before they meet. We see him with the snowman uh, and the woman with the pram uh, and the policeman before they meet. Now, that's a nice little thing, nice little scene with the policeman, and shooting out was very good in it, but it robs this uh, idea of, we're robbed of the impact of Ruby meeting him for the first time, uh, because we watch it happen, but it doesn't mean it really mean anything. In the same way that um, the first time you see Eccleston's Doctor is when he grabs Rose's hand and says, run, if the first time we'd have seen Shooty's Doctor was uh, her knocking the glass off and him catching it, and I'd even forget the twirling on the dance floor. That's We don't see him. If we'd have seen him the first time catching the glass when she drops it, that would have had a similar vibe and we'd have been away. But it, ju it, just, uh, it just didn't all coalesce into a, a satisfying whole. It felt like a series of vignettes that uh, were all quite disparate, which is what I mean by messy. So yeah, uh, dis disappointing day viewing at Christmas. I did enjoy it 
more on subsequent viewings. Uh, never to the point of actually like full on liking it. Uh, uh, so the dust has settled on it, kind of just being a. <sighs> Number eight, The Giggle. I think The Toy Maker, again, like I've said, suffers from what Maestro suffered from, suffers from what Sutek uh, suffered from. Uh, it started promisingly, and the scene with Donna and Stooky Sue is excellent. The weird, surreal imagery of the puppet doctor also, also worked. The idea of The Toy Maker making everybody win their games and thinking that they're right doesn't feel like The Toy Maker's MO. Uh, and... It, I couldn't really get on board with um, what was going on and how it became a toy maker story. So the toy maker himself was doomed for me in the story before uh, before it began, despite Neil Patrick Harris being quite good performing it. But again, defeated far too easily. Now I know that uh, he has to abide by the rules of the game and the game is catch, but the toy maker can play catch as the toy maker because the toy maker is challenged to a game of catch and the toy maker can be in several places at once if the uh, spice up your life scene is anything to go by so he shouldn't really miss a catch regardless of whether or not he has to play by the rules because the rules of catch are you play catch and the toy maker can move in a way that we can't <sighs> didn't work for me. By Generation is fine in concept but I do genuinely think they had to merge again afterwards and there could have been some great drama in, uh, obviously we'd know it would be shooty but uh, the Doctor's not knowing which Doctor would emerge as the, the prominent one and given how the 10th Doctor didn't want to go, it would have been sort of like quite good drama for the 14th Doctor to steal himself from merging and then possibly not coming back and then in the event not coming back because when a doctor changes i don't mind an, an unconventional regeneration uh and it's not like doctor who hasn't done this before uh tom baker into peter davison is not your conventional regeneration and the watcher is fairly sort of like nebulous so i'm not against an unusual regeneration but for a regeneration to have any impact, I do think you need to lose the previous Doctor. So I'm not saying that they couldn't have split and played catch with the toy maker, the two of them, but I do think they needed to have merged again afterwards because for a Doctor to go forward, the other one has to be lost. Uh, so I, I didn't care for the 14th Doctor's happy retirement doesn't sit well with me at all. That's my only issue with the bi-generation. I don't mind the bi-generation as an idea. <clears throat> it's just how it how it was left. Number seven, Dot and Bubble. This isn't an episode uh, that's like any other Doctor Who episode, I don't think. Whether or not and when you notice um, that it's a society of white supremacists, Regardless of when that comes for you in the episode, um, the ending of it, whether or not it recontextualizes an awful lot or very little, um, is still such a uh, brave way to end a Doctor Who episode, even just on narrative terms. Um, so if the if the if the context of that scene did nothing for you, and it did for me because uh, it addressed it this issue sort of like head on in a way that I wouldn't have expected Doctor Who to do. But even just on narrative terms, the Doctor kind of loses. The Doctor pleads with a group of people to let him save their lives. They refuse and they go off. He watches them go off and then he goes back to the TARDIS. To end an episode like that is what I think is brave. Uh, I think it's um, also some degrees brave to do the, uh, the Society of White Supremacists and uh, put clues to that but not make it explicit until the end. And it gives Shruti Gatwell one, something incredible to play against to show how good he is. But it also uh, says a lot about the Doctor. And it addresses the Doctor's change in appearance in a more overt way than I thought they were going to. Uh, when the Doctor... Be 
went from Capaldi to Jodie Whittaker, um, there were some mentions of how she used to be a man, and I think it happens in The Witchfinders, where obviously she's accused of being a witch. But her gender doesn't really impede her in her adventures um, in, this, in the way that Shooty's race does here. Uh, so for them to do that, because I thought it was a slightly missed opportunity to not at least give one adventure where that does happen to Jodie, because uh, I thought it would have given her opportunity to show just how good she is, because um, while I like the Chibnall era um, uh, more more than uh, many seem to, um, uh, I don't think it gave Jodie enough opportunity to show just how good she was. There's a lot of Doctor Who fans that don't that haven't seen how good Jodie can be. Conversely, this addresses it in a way that is is very satisfying. And so it ends up being uh, 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 two separate things for me, Dot and Bubble, because as, a, as, a, as, a, as an exercise and an experiment, I love it. As an episode itself, I, I find it sort of okay. So I enjoy how Dot and Bubble makes me think more than I enjoy watching Dot and Bubble. Uh, and it's not because I don't understand it, and it's not because I'm made uncomfortable by it. Uh, it's just because I don't find it very enjoyable as an episode. As an experiment, though, very good. Number six, Space Babies. That's about right, I think. Uh, six out of 12, uh, so it's in the middle. Uh, I find it... Uh, sort of like fairly disposable, quite throwaway. It's a season opener, uh, establishes the rules of the show to Ruby um, and does so quite well. It uh, is puerile, but in a way that um, like just feels knowingly daft, knowingly silly. The image of Space Babies is achieved sort of like, it's always gonna be like a little bit janky. Uh, but it's so it's it's better than say for example the babies at the beginning of the Flash movie, which it so easily could have been here. It's just breezy, daft. Hey, ah, come here, everybody! Look at this mad new mad show that you might not have seen before. So I can't really hold too much against it. Number five, the Star Beast. A lot rode on the Star Beast. We hadn't had an episode in thirteen months, and. It was Rusty Davis coming back after, uh, well, at that point, like almost 14 years. Uh, same with David Tennant, but 10 because he was in the 50th. And Catherine Tate coming back as well. Uh, it tugged on nostalgia for one particular year of the show's uh, vast history. As a 60th anniversary, that didn't feel super satisfying. But at this point, not knowing how Wild Blue Yonder and the Giggle were going to uh, transpire, uh, and bearing in mind at this point, Wild Blue Yonder was still being kept incredibly, incredibly secret, um, the Star Beast didn't have so much pressure on it to be 60th anniversary esque. Uh, it, in essence, in the same way that Space Babies was just like, this is. The, the opener, this is sort of like we're easing back in. And it does that quite well. It realizes the Meep nicely. The Wrath Warriors are nicely realized. Uh, the 14th Doctor, like I say, uh, is different enough from the 10th that it doesn't feel like a repeat. And there's some connective tissue with the psychic paper still thinking, the Doctor still thinking, Panning over the psychic paper, which they'll say Miss instead of Mister. So like, that is all um, good. The ending doesn't uh, because that's got the connective tissue as well about the Doctor used to be a woman, which I'm glad was referenced, but it was fed into the ending in a way that I just didn't think worked at all. The road knitting back together was like guff. So while it had elements that made me go, oh, here we go we're all back again even a deadlock seal like I could, I'll quite happily never hear the words deadlock seal ever again um, but there it was uh, uh, so while it did have moments where I was like oh no um, it still did its job of kicking off this trilogy of episodes in a in a um, in an effective and 
light enough way that um, it could capture people that maybe the show had lost. And so the Star Beast is not a uh, gold standard episode of Doctor Who, but what it is, is uh, one of the uh, strongest examples of kicking off a run. Um, uh, Doctor Who is back, um, Star Beast does that very well. Number four, Rogue. Rogue came at exactly the right point. When you think about it, actually, uh, Devil's Chord, Boom, 73 Yards, and Dot and Bubble are all each in their own way, sort of like fairly different types and experimental types of Doctor Who episodes. So Rogue comes along and feels almost unashamedly traditional. The stakes aren't super high. Uh, I mean, obviously the world is in danger, but the world's always in danger in Doctor Who. It's done in a really cheeky way. And coming right before we knew that like the two-episode finale was going to be... I mean, I don't think... I certainly wasn't prepared for how bad I found that finale, but uh, we still knew it was going to be sort of like involved to pay off these things. Rogue can just have fun, and it's really good at having fun. And so I found, uh, just had a blast with Rogue from start to finish. It told its story really effectively, it told its story really economically, and the introduction of uh, Rogue himself was a, uh, like I say, a fun, cheeky addition. And it gives Shruti Gatwa opportunity to carve his Doctor out as a very different interpretation, which I always think a new Doctor should do. And I always get wary because the more Doctors we have, the more difficult it is to make your interpretation unique. And Shruti Gatwa is doing admirably, and I think Rogue is where he does it best so far. Number three, Boom. Directly after this episode, uh, and when I did my video digesting Boom, this probably would have been at the very top for me. And while it is still very, 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 very good, I'd say it's Shooty Gatwa's first classic. It's stripped down, uh, it's more traditionally sci-fi than the uh, the, this new era had been up until that point, so because even because um, the star beat was, was fairly domesticated, um, uh, while blue yonder, while you know obviously yes, set in space on a spaceship, uh, still had a kind of like wildly experimental leaning to it. Uh, the giggle, uh, same, uh, was more fantasy anyway with the toy makers power set. Church on Ruby Road, again. Goblins felt very fantasy-led. Space Babies, I guess, but even that with the the imagery of the babies felt almost cartoonish. Uh, the Devil's Chord had Maestro and was very, again, like sort of like fantasy-led. Boom felt like a traditional Doctor Who episode. Plonking Shooty and Millie down in that early on in their run consolidates them as a, uh, as the Doctor and Companion in the show that we know and love. Uh, and they get to put their stamp on it. Uh, Stephen Moffat is um, a very good writer in terms of teeing things up in a very obvious way, but he sort of doesn't let you know he's doing it. It's not signposted. Um, so like the events that lead up to Ruby getting shot, when it happens, it's a shock, but also it feels very natural progression that it led to that point. The ending of Boom is the thing that lets it down. Because um, it, again, it's not just a misdirection, it's a falsehood. Uh, oh, um, the software has assimilated the uh, uh, the artificial intelligence of the dad. Oh no, it hasn't. Like, I don't, I didn't care for that at all. Um, but it's a, that's only like a tiny bit of uh, an episode that is, uh, I guess, essentially, or again, like another one of Moffat's strengths, which is almost like the chamber piece. It's very stripped down, it's very stripped back. The Doctor doesn't move from the landmine for most of the episode. It just feels like Moffat being Moffat. Um, uh, it's been long enough, I guess, to miss him. Other than the ending, it's 
excellent at what it does. Number two, 73 yards. Yep, very divisive, but I honestly think now that I've let it sort of like swirl around in my brain uh, uh, for a couple of weeks, I do think 73 yards is the strongest of the um, of the first season. It uh, gives Millie Gibson uh, an awful lot to do and quite almost against the odds, given one, how young she is, and two, it was the first episode she shot. She nails it. It is not like any other Doctor Who episode that I can think of, which is almost like a, a, a catchphrase for this season, uh, which again is sort of like going to show that this is not a repeat of the first era. And even though I didn't like the finale, I'm very glad that we're in a new era and not a, uh, a regression. And 73 yards cannot be called a regression. 73 yards is uh, probably my second favourite Russell C. Davis script. Now, for those of you that are wondering what number one is, it's obviously the only one left. That's also a Russell C. Davis script. While I think the story is probably better, the script itself, uh, I think 73 yards is um, unapologetically uh, mysterious. But that's part of the tone it's going for. So like I said, yes, it leaves us with more questions than answers. But sometimes art does that. Uh, I don't feel like not knowing some of the answers impedes my enjoyment of 73 yards, which is all about the journey as I'm watching it. Uh, I don't know what the older Ruby says when people go up and approach her, and I don't know, whatever she says, why it has the impact that it does. But I don't feel like that ruins the episode while I'm watching it. If anything, I feel like it adds to the confusion and then that only makes Ruby feel more exposed and lonely. And it's conveyed incredibly well and best when uh, Kate Stewart, Kate Stewart's face changes. So while we don't find out everything i guess i don't feel like i need to find out everything number one wild blue yonder yeah i guess like the secrecy around it made everybody think this is where all the cameos are going to come in and it wasn't just secrecy in terms of not showing us anything it was overt secrecy in that they doctored images and said redacted on it so I guess it made everybody, especially with the 60th anniversary, our imaginations ran wild and we were like, oh, Matt Smith could come back, Capaldi could come back, Jodie Whittaker could come back. And I think it was a missed opportunity. I think those three 60th anniversary specials did a terrible job of celebrating 60 years of Doctor Who. But with the Star Beast being fairly solid and with Wild Blue Yonder being, I think, one of the best episodes of Doctor Who in ages, uh, it actually became a, a strong enough mini series of Doctor Who uh, to coincide with the 6th anniversary specials, but did not celebrate 6th anniversary very well at all. That said, I wasn't disappointed with Wild Blue Yonder because I had a blast while it was on. The unapologetically cartoon imagery of the long arms and the long jaw spoke to a vibe that they were going for that I hadn't expected them to. And uh, David Tennant and Catherine Tate uh, with the, the dual roles as the Doctor and Donna and the Not Things. Absolutely cracking performances. And Russell T. Davis, it's almost like he, he's, um, he's tapped into what he tapped into when he wrote Midnight, but put more fun into it at the same time. And as a result, uh, I find Wild Blue Yonder such fun. And because now the dust has settled and this now Doctor Who, including season one, exists as past tense now to watch them again i have to wait for their turn to come on the marathon which will be a really long time and i have to say i'm really looking forward to getting to wild blue yonder again just to see what i make of it the the next time around uh it's one of those episodes that stayed with me and uh that's why uh when i came to do this ranking 
weeks, months in this case, after the fact, um, I couldn't put it anywhere but number one. As ever, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this sort of like uh, uh, brief look back uh, on our most recent Doctor Who history, then you know how YouTube works. Please do give it a like and share it around. And what do you think of this new era so far? Is um, uh, is it feeling like a uh, a new era for you, or is it just feeling like uh, it's the same? Uh, it's series one to four all over again. Uh, do you think that um, going forward? we've got uh, a lot to look forward to or has the finale kind of like soured it a little bit for you or did you really like the finale and can't wait to see what where the show goes next let me know in the comments below and uh, i will see you back here soon for obviously the ongoing doctor who marathon uh, i've got an ongoing james Bond marathon if that's your sort of thing um but i'm also not going to stop uh talking about Doctor Who in the present tense. So if you don't want to miss any of those, please do hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell, and I will see you soon.